Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. My name is Mehmet Emre Özcanlı and I am the president of TASI, Turkish Association for Seismic Isolation. In TASI webinar series, worldwide reputed seismic isolation experts present on seismic isolation applications in their countries. Today, we are presenting passive structural control applications in Turkey, presented by Professor Dr. Mustafa Erdik. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in our TASIV YouTube channel chat panel. I'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions at the end. I would like to thank you, Mr. Paolo Clemente, who is ACC president as he distributed our webinar announcement to all ACC members throughout the world. Dr. Mustafa Erdik is a professor emeritus of earthquake engineering at Boğaziçi University. Istanbul and president of the Turkish Earthquake Foundation. He has received his BS uh, degree from Middle East Technical University, MS and PhD degrees from Rice University, USA. He has worked with United Nations organizations and several other international foundations around the world on earthquake engineering problems. He has authored about 300 scientific publications he is the recipient of United Nations Sasakawa Disaster Prevention Award, NATO's Science for Peace Summit Prize, Bruce Bolt Medal given by Earthquake Engineering Research Institute USA, Professor Nicolo Ambrose Distinguished Lecture Award given by the European Association for Earthquake Engineering, and Science Award by Scientific and Technological Research Council of Turkey. Now, without further introduction, we will turn the time over to the Professor Dr. Mustafa Erdi. Uh, thank you, Mehmet, for the excellent setup and nice introduction. Well, you don't see him here, but Bahadur is in the uh, control center, so he's controlling all the operations. So if there's anything wrong with the uh, webinar, you should put the, put the blame on him, not me. Well, anyway, good morning and good night and maybe good day. I don't know where all you are. I imagine that most of you are from Turkey, but then again, I'm sure that we will have others joining us. Uh, I'll be talking today on the passive structural control applications in Turkey. Uh, just go to the subject. The, uh, these are the structural control applications. The one that you see is the conventional ones. Essentially, we do a ductal demand design so that ductile of member is something that we control. We can use a seismic walls or shear walls, and we can use braces. Those are the conventional type of uh, control or structural control, structural performance control. What we call the passive structural control are in addition to those. Uh, the most common one, and I'll be talking today a lot, mostly on this thing is the base isolation design. Then we can have a tuned mass dampers, uh, we can have either viscous type damping or hysteric type damping added to the structure, or we can have buckling grass strain braces, or we can build another structure and join two structures with a joint damper. All of these are known as the passive structural control. While if there's intelligence in those things in a way that if they sense the ground motion and for example, change the stiffness or change the damping here, then they become active structural control. Active structural control, some experimental use in Japan, but not not really a worldwide application of it. Now, the number of structures with passive structural control in Turkey is about 140 as of uh, 2020. Uh, this may be plus minus five. I don't know that number well, but it's, it is growing mostly in the base isolation design, but we would like to see applications grow also in the other types of passive structural control. What I will be talking today is essentially, I'll just go over briefly the Turkish seismic isolation code. And then uh, most of the seismic isolation, the important seismic ap ap isolation applications in Turkey deal with the hospital. So I'll go over them. I'll just cover three or four of them. Then I will try to give some examples from other passive structural control applications. And the problem, the last, uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes of my talk, I will talk with the problems, issues, and suggestions 
for the uh, for the both improvement of applications and also the widening of the applications, meaning that instead of 140, we should be dealing maybe thousands of structures because that is a real uh, real lifesaver essentially for countries that suffer from earthquakes. The Turk seismic isolation codes start to, to be uh, in application by the beginning of this year, although we started working on it since uh, 2017, probably at least three years before. Uh, it's essentially based on the principles of ASC 710 and ASC 716, some influences from EC8. Uh, in addition to those, we also use the ASC 4113 and then the several MCA reports uh, were also considered. So it's uh, in that sense, it's a hybrid document, but we try to choose the ones that represent the response of the isolated structure in a much better way. Obviously, this just covers the base isolation or the seismic isolation, and the code just limits itself to the base isolated structures. So if you want to uh, put uh, isolation in the, in the in mid floors, that's not exactly covered by the code itself. And the code does not also cover uh, the, uh, the dampers or the tune mass dampers. So I think we should be working hard also to write a code for those as well. The, uh, for isolators, uh, the material manufacturing process of elastomeric isolation units are to play to conform the requirements of the European standard. And then unless otherwise stated in the code, the design of isolation units will be based on EN 13.3.7.3 and their current revisions. Uh, in, in certain instances, there are uh, stipulations in the code that may go beyond it, but then again, we usually follow these European standards for the uh, isolators themselves. Now, the, the Turkish code is, the I believe, is one of the co only codes that gives the performance objectives and the permitted design procedures in a very explicit manner. So we treat them as the new building with seismic isolation, existing buildings, so retrofitted with seismic isolation. So there's new building with seismic isolation, this is retrofit with seismic isolation, and both deal with the superstructure. Then when it comes to the isolation system and substructure, it doesn't matter if it is new building and existing building, and we just call them new and retrofit buildings with isolation system and substructure. What we see here are the earthquake levels. We have two earthquake levels. There's design-based earthquake and the MCE earthquake. This is 475-year earthquake, and this is 2,475-year earthquake. And then uh, for uh, superstructure, we essentially do a design-based earthquake uh, analysis and computations. And then we divide into two categories, the seismic design category 1, 4, 1, 2, 4, 3, 4, A, and the seismic design category 1A to A. And these seismic design categories further depend on the building risk category. So if, the, if we are dealing with a uh, risky building, and then this is building risk category A, and then if the, uh, the SDS level is about 0.5, then we easily put ourselves in 1A to A, and then we operate usually in this range. So what is asked for new buildings here is that uh, the continued functionality is asked and the ferment design procedure is uh, what we call the strength-based design. Now for retrofitted structures, the minimum is not essentially uh, the continued functionality, but we can also go for the uh, limited damage. So that's, an, uh, that's a plus for the third code, it doesn't exist really in other codes. And when it comes to the obvious, the isolation system substructure, we have to treat the whatever is under the isolation system, we have to treat it as being uh, the continued functionality, regardless of the seismic design category and use, while well, for the uh, isolation units, obviously we use the displacement based design, but for the uh, foundation or the building under the substructure under the isolation system, we can use strength based design. Those are written really ex explicitly in our code compared to the other codes. The, there are some specific considerations for design, and then uh, the design based earthquake I, des I defined for you that's 10% in 50 years, and then the maximum considered earthquake MC is 2% in 50 years. 
the we have to assign the minimum maximum and minimum property modification factors on the basis of aging testing conditions manufacturing variations so that's an important uh, stipulation in the code the response modification uh, coefficients are given explicitly as 1.2 for the uh, continued functionality and 1.5 for the immediate occupancy the this is what we have taken from the euro code it does not exist in the american codes it says the while well, it exists now in the asc 716 probably not that explicit though if the uncoupled vertical vibration period of assault building is larger than 0.1 second this is usually the case if uh, if we use elastomeric isolators then the vertical component of the ground motion should take into account the analysis methods are threefold. This is the same as the with the other codes, the equilateral force, mode superposition, and the nonlinear response history analysis. And then the ELF procedure, that's the basic procedure that you have to do it, no matter what your structure is, because this sets the uh, minimum uh, displacements and the minimum shear base, uh, shear force in the structure, uh, or limits it because through these analysis, you can lower it only to about 10% to 20% more. And then the another thing that exists in our code is that we have to use 11 sets of equilibrium motions uh, compared to usually seven in other codes. Those are the ones that are somewhat distinct from the other codes. The, as I said, the ELF procedure is the procedure that you have to use regardless of the, uh, regardless of the type of condition you are in, type of structure you are in. And then for certain cases, you can just limit your analysis to the ELF. And those are the ones that you can use ELF only without resorting to other procedures that your structure should be located in, in, in pretty good soil conditions. The damping ratio should be less than 30%. That does not mean that it can be more than, it, it can be more than 30%. Yes, it can, but then you cannot limit your analysis to LF. You have to use other analysis in this case. Then, then we need, we limit the irregularity of, irregularity of structure. The number of stories should be less than four and then the 20 meter. There are a few structures that meet that uh, criteria in Turkey. So essentially we all, I mean, we all base our design on the base of the nonlinear time history analysis for that reason. And then the isolation period should be less than four seconds. The vertical period should also be less than 0.1 second and no uplift in the isolation units. If we compare it with the with other codes, this is a comparison uh, of the essential features size of isolation goals. When I say essential features, that's the design methods. They are essentially the same in all codes, except that in Japanese code, in certain conditions, you can use no calculation. Those are very simple structures, and I believe that everything is prescribed, so you can just go ahead and do it that way. And now, and then, except that I think in Japanese code, they don't have the response spectral model analysis, whereas it exists in the, in the USA code, Italian code, and the Turkish code. I say Italian code because EC8 is a framework of a code. A country should take it and then make it a code itself. EC8 by itself is just a guideline. There are some suggestions in it, but those suggestions uh, can be changed by the nation itself. So I, I just opted here for the Italian code. The return period for analysis, this is, well, in ASC, that's MCR. Uh, R means the risk base. So it's somewhat different than the hazard that we are using, but for time being, let's assume that they are the same. This is same as what we are using here. And then the, in Japan, it is, well, it is between 50 and 500 years, but that's estimated because it's not explicitly defined. In, uh, in Japan, it says 475 for the superstructure, but it changed if it's a hospital and for the isolation system is 975 years. And then the, there are <coughs> safety factors on the isolation capacity. For ASC, it all depends on the test, same as Turkish code. And then the Italian code, again from tests, but for reliability, we increased the, the displacement by 1.2. And for Japanese code, there are certain factors. Uh, for the modeling, we use 2D for equivalent lateral load, otherwise 3D, 2D, and then uh, even for the nonlinear time analysis, Japanese can use 2D. 
the, the for Italian code and Turkish code, the same after American code. Those are the limit uh, drift ratios, allowed drift ratios. Well, that depends on the type of earthquake obviously have used, but the drift ratio is also vary from country to country. The location of the devices for the American, doesn't matter, you can put your device anywhere in the code. Same with the Italian, but the Japanese and Turkish codes based only. And then the this is the vertical stiffness uh, divided by the horizontal uh, stiffness. Well, there's a, for elastomeric bearings, there's a uh, limit here in the Italian code. And then the tension in the isolators, Americans allow for tension in the isolators. Well, be conditionally allow it, but the, the others don't allow it. And then the, that's essentially the difference between them. The limits for the application of the equal load, uh, equivalent load procedure, I have given you the, the reason, the, the limits for Turkey. The limits change between countries, but the interesting thing is that for example, height of the building, Japanese put a height of 60 meters on that. And then the Americans, that's about 20 meters, that's about 20 meters. Again, the maximum number of stories, Japanese do not assign the maximum number of story. There are some limitations on the eccentricity, but not on the American code, but they are pretty much the same between countries regarding the use of the LF. Now let's come to base isolated hospitals in Turkey. Well, as of 2020, about 40 hospitals with seismic isolations are complete or under construction. This would make about 25,000 beds. And there was a competition by the engineering news record in 2017, which says that three of the largest 10 base isolated buildings that's measured by total floor in the world. Uh, and then they essentially, they ranked them. The Adana at that time, the Adana Integrated Health Campus, Adana, with 430,000 square meters and 1,500 square units, was second after the Apple Park in Cupertuna, California. That's the Apple's administrative building in Cupertuna. I will talk about it. And then it's just slightly above that one, but it, it got the first place and the Adana got the second place. But in the 10, we have three other structures. That's the Sparta City Hospital and the Azure Regional Research and Training Hospital. And so that's, and regarding the size of the structures, we are pretty good, but when it comes to number of structures, always number of structures are much lower than those in, in, in other countries of the world, especially if you compare it with uh, Japan, uh, China, and Italy. The numbers in, in United States is not that great because I mean, with the exception of California, it's not still really used that much. Now this is the Adana City Training and the Research Hospital. Uh, the structural engineering was Vulcan Engineering, that's a Turkish company, and it was constructed by Renaissance again, that's again a Turkish company. And then, well, it has essentially uh, four blocks, but all locate on the same podium here. We will see in a while the plan of it, and it uses about 1550 the triple, triple pendulum isolators. That's the location of it. It is, there are lots of faults around it, and then the the MCE motion is quite sizable. It goes about uh, 1.3 at the short period range. Obviously, we are, we are dealing more in those ranges. And then this is the uh, plan view. That's the section. We see the section here. Those are the, uh, the triple towers that we see at this section, this one and this one. But there are two other more. And this is the, essentially the, the finite element structure that's used for the analysis. And that's the location of the isolators. It says there's an army of isolators. And then essentially three types of the uh, uh, triple uh, curved surface friction type of sliders on it. And then they are distributed all around the building. This is a picture from the construction. You can see there's an immense construction. That's the somewhat uh, midway through the construction process. And that's the finished stage. As I said, this was the second in rank in in uh, 2017 competition by the engineering news record. Now this is an hospital that has opened recently. And then at least one, uh, one I, I think this one opened recently, they are about to open and that's called Istanbul Başakşehir Çaman Sakura City Hospital. 
it has the total floor area of more than one million square meter. That is a very sizable area if you comp if you consider that the 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 largest terminal in the world, uh, the uh, the airplane terminal is the Istanbul Airport is is about one million square meter. This the total area is above that one. So it is currently forget about hospital. It's currently world's largest isolated building. And then I don't. I think it will take take some time for any other country to to reach that uh, stage. There are 2,040 base isolators, and the total bed capacity is close to 2,700. Uh, contractor is again RMS Renaissance. Architectural firm is Perkins and Will USA, and structural firm is Arup Engineering USA. That's Arup Los Angeles, but the uh, most of the people work at Arup. At least half of them are of uh, Turkish origin. So, and it is uh, it's a very competitive design in that sense. And uh, that's the section of the structure. It has to built on piles, all the foundation, because the foundation is, is very heterogeneous. In some areas, it's just film material, in some soft material. So we have to make piles and make a foundation on top of it, and then get the structure uh, on, on top of that. So in that sense, it's an expensive operation. Those are the isolators that are used. I don't want to go that much detail, but those are one of the largest isolators. It's about 1.6 meter in diameter. And then the the this is the uh, this is an isometric view of the structure. Those uh, two models are used. One of the E tabs model that's mostly for the design of the superstructure and the LS Dyna model. LS Dyna model is allows full nonlinearity of the essential, the, the triple uh, curved uh, friction pendulum systems, uh, you don't deal with the, uh, with their, you don't have to treat their hysteresis curve as a bilinear curve, but you can go through all three stages of the uh, hysteresis and then do a very good analysis. That's why it's relied on the ls Dyna model in this sense. And this is the setup of the isolators. As I said, it's again army of the isolators. And you can see that this is the you can see that the, when the isolators get concentrated here, there's concentrated here and here. Those are at the base of these blocks, and those are real uh, big uh, isolated units. In fact, two of them are used here. They are under the cores of the these three towers. Uh, um, cores mean the shear walls on these these three towers. And this uh, this is a view from the uh, during its construction stage, and this is uh, its constructed shape. Another hospital that's along this line, and this is using the, this one use LRBs. This is about 1,350 bed hospital, and the structural engineering was OBS engineering, and again constructed by Renaissance. And then the, the largest LRB unit has a diameter of about 1.3 centimeter, although today's the LRB units goes up to even two meter uh, diameter LRB units. So that's not really big ones, but it uses them. And then this is the, uh, this is the final shape of the hospital, it's operational now. This is another hospital that I think is important because that's the largest building in the world, forget about hospital, retrofitted with seismic isolation. That hospital was uh, was an old hospital, probably from 19, uh, even from 1985 and whatnot. And it was, try, they tried to retrofit again with conventional procedures, but it didn't work out. And then finally, the, uh, the IPCU, the uh, Istanbul Project Coordination Unit, has taken the, the job of retrofitting it with isolators, so they retrofitted, Timo was the uh, essentially the controller of the whole design. And what they did is that they installed the isolator units essentially at these levels on these towers. That, uh, well, that is that stage. This is the location where the isolation plane, uh, isolation plane is, isolation layer is, and those are the towers, there are several towers of this sort. So it was a very uh, delicate operation because although there are no patients in it, then you have to treat the structure very carefully so that you can reach your uh, objectives. And then in certain areas, for example, at the bottom of the staircases and at the bottom of the elevator sheds, there are flat sliders, but most of them are on lead rubber bearings. So 
about 154 flat sliders and 188 LRTB isolators. The isolate displacement capacity was 50 centimeter on those. This is an operation uh, from the uh, placement of the isolators. Essentially, the, those are clamped uh, beams, uh, well, square beams on top of it. First, you clamp it through these bolts to the uh, to the uh, to the column itself, and then you cut it at this section. You have jacks here, okay? You cut this section and remove that section, and then you place the isolator over there. Well, these are just a place so that the isolation does not move. What that's and those are steel guards here at the top of the columns, the top and bottom of the columns. So that has been applied in all the columns in a very careful manner. In a coordinated manner, you cannot. Uh, you have to know your order where you cut and place those things, and then it has been completed successfully. As I said, that is the largest retrofitted building with isolators in the world today. And this is where the isolators are placed. You can see the isolators here, essentially, just at that location. And then that's the final shape. Today is in operation. It's part of the Marmara University. The other ones, I'll just go very fast, just to remind you what's being done. This is for some time is the, I, I believe it still is the largest seismic or terminal building in the world. The Atatürk uh, Air Force Terminal uh, would have taken this job, but then they decided not to use isolation over there. So currently it still is. It's a steel structure. And then these are the isolator units under the, uh, that's the steel beams and columns, obviously. And that was a delicate operation itself. It was again, the engineer was again out of Los Angeles. And then the LASA data centers use them. And then uh, there are several of them here. I just showed you three of them, but that's part of the uh, data center because they want to protect the, the data itself. So protection of data comes from the protection of the building and the contents of the building, which are the, which are the LASA computers and whatnot. And then the Seismic isolation residential building is something in Turkey that started rather new and then it's going fast, except that while well, this is the first uh, residence in Turkey that was base isolated, that was in Selim Pasha near Silivri and that was about four years ago. Then uh, two years ago, one apartment building as in Moda was retrofitted with isolators instead of conventional retrofit it was what that building was uh, ready for that the reason being is that the concrete quality was good and then there were around it was all uh, free so that the building could move so there was enough space for the move and now there is recently a, a complex a Mavera complex uh, of 16 buildings that's under construction and that will be the that will be the first start of building such complexes in Turkey, and we hope that it will uh, emerge. the The interesting thing here is that the interesting thing is that uh, there was a we created a, we did a study. In fact, the, the the Turkish Earthquake Foundation and the and then our colleagues made a study together with the Bridgestone on the feasibility study of the use of seismic isolation system for residential buildings in Turkey. And the conclusions of this are very striking. It says the use of seismic isolation for mid-rise moment frame RC buildings increased the cost by 5% to 10%. That's the construction cost. When it comes to sale price, probably two to 4% over the conventional system. However, although this comparison is there, we should pay attention that this is with totally different performance criteria. So for the, uh, for the conventional system, we ask for the uh, life safety, whereas for the seismic isolation, we ask for the immediate occupancy. If we want to do the comparison on the same uh, performance criteria, suppose that we choose, not suppose, but we choose the performance criteria as life safety, then, which means that if the comparison is done by keeping the structural performance criteria as immediate occupancy, okay, immediate occupancy. Obviously, immediate occupancy means that you can protect your structure fully, but then you can have lots of non-structural and equipment damage because it shakes out. Then the construction cost of conventional system will increase to even threefold, thus making the seismic isolation much more cost-effective and preferable. And you can do it, but then again, 
you can only protect the structure itself. Means that if your structure, that means that even the largest earthquake comes, your structure will say elastic. If it stays elastic, and if the ground acceleration under the structure, say 0.5 G, then the acceleration at top of the structure can be easily uh, 1.5 G, not 0.5 G, but 1.5 G. And at that acceleration, it's difficult to keep any equipment, even people safe. So you can protect the structure, but not the, not the equipment and the non-structural components. So that's something that we have to pay attention. The an important application of the for industrial buildings. In industrial buildings, the applications are very limited in Turkey, although they grow around the world. And then I'll just show you two of them. One of them is the Egegas LNG tanks. Those are built probably about 15 years ago. And those are one of the first applications of seismic isolation in fact in Turkey. And then it's used uh, LRB units. Those are the source LRB units and those are the uh, liquid uh, uh, LNG tanks. Those are obviously kept here under cyrogenic uh, conditions, very cold, so that we don't want to have any problem with the earthquake. So that's why seismic isolation is used. Recently, there was another application for the Samsung ammonia tank. And then it was a retrofit application. And then these isolators are put on the columns here to protect the uh, tank, which will come above this one from damages. The other applications that are going uh, well in Turkey uh, as probably about the same as the structures, buildings themselves is the for bridges and viaducts. And then it started essentially with the Bolu viaduct. And then there are several bridges, then it goes to Mecidiye viaduct, Sakarya bridge, and then the Gülbun bridge on the Black Sea coastal highway. Then the there were uh, viaducts on the Ankara Istanbul High Speed Railway, about 18 viaducts. Then the Gebze Izmir Highway, which is which is total open now, uses another uh, Lhasa, uh, about 30 viaducts, 30 viaducts, and then 11 of these viaducts use seismic isolation that and that viaducts consume about 5,000 lead rubber bearings. That's a huge number if you look at it that way, and then the Suspension bridges, both the Osman Gazi suspension bridge and the and the Yavuz Sultan Selim suspension bridge, as well as the uh, the Bosphorus one suspension bridge, uses uh, isolation. They are not isolated structures, but they use uh, not isolators. They use both isolators and the dampers as well to, for earthquake protection. But they are not called isolated bridges, as is the case with the, such as the these viaducts. Now, this is the uh, Ankara Istanbul Highway Speed Train Viaducts. Uh, and then uh, this, this, is a, this is the viaduct that's all essentially uh, isolated. Isolation of the high speed train viaducts is a delicate issue because the tolerances, movement tolerances for the uh, high speed trains are very strict. So you have to uh, pay much more attention than that of the other roads. And then this is uh, Gebze Izmir Highway Viaducts. This is Osman Gazi Suspension Bridge. As I said, this suspension bridge uh, used big dampers to, uh, to limit the motion of the deck in this direction. And then the approach viaducts, both the south approach viaduct and the north approach viaduct also use uh, isolation units, both of them use isolation units, so those isolated, isolated bridges. The Bolo Viaducts is a, is a famous case, lots of publications on it. The, the, the Bolo Viaduct, you know, was damaged by the Dizzy earthquake. And then a new uh, retrofit design has been made. Luckily, none of the uh, none of the decks collapsed, but they were in the verge of collapse. Then a new design has been made. And then while well, these seats are enlarged and then the extra friction, uh, double stage uh, curved surface friction uh, device are used for this. And in Istanbul, the one that you use probably most of the time is the Mecidiyeköy viaduct. That's a retrofit, but that was retrofitted uh, without destroying the, uh, without disturbing the traffic on the viaduct itself. 
again it is it was jacked up it was supported by the steel columns then this part is cut and then the isolators are placed the sakari Eki viaduct is an important viaduct that is just about 300 meter north of north of the fault so huge ground motion it was designed for a pga for 0.83 g so that's an important bridge in the sense the use of dampers Barking restrain braces and tuned mass dampers. Those are another set of uh, passive control devices. Buckling restrain braces, it's in the code, but it's in the uh, actual uh, building design code, not, not in the, uh, not in the, uh, it's not treated in our code as I said, as a, as a passive control device. So it's just treat as a, as a brace, but it's essentially a passive control device because it includes damping as well. It's used in Renaissance towers and Folkart Twin towers. Then there are one structure, the structural multi plaza that uses uh, dampers as diagonal bracing elements. Those are viscous dampers. And then the retrofit of Bosphorus suspension bridge and the Golden Home Bridge and Otakoi approach use essential, they use dampers, but they use hysteric dampers. And the, in Yavuz Sultan Selim Bridge, you can see the viscous dampers that are used to control the vibration of the span and the high angle cables. Tuned mass dampers in Turkey, although needed in most of the tall structures, are not used. They are limited only to tall industrial stacks. But if you go around, even in, uh, in Azerbaijan, I know at least two buildings, one of them is Sokar Tower, that use the tuned mass dampers in that sense. This is the use of the uh, Bakun Grestain brace on the Renaissance Alliance Tower. It is used at this floor, essentially as an outrigger system, but it traverses two floors. So that's a long one, essentially for these systems, for uh, both Bakun prevented uh, braces and for dampers to use unit displacement. You cannot get enough displacement at one floor. So you may you need to carry it at least to two floors so you can get some uh, displacement on it. And to get that displacement, you need, you need to have a length of about 9.5 meters so that uh, during a storm, okay, it, it can go through displacement. If it cannot go through displacement, it, it can be any other brace because you can't use any damping of that system. The other one that are used in the Istanbul technical part, they are used here. And they're also used in Folkart towers, actually 220 meters, those are tall towers in Izmir, those two one of the, the, I don't know if they moved during the earthquake or not. I don't think they did, but then again, it's something that needs to be measured. The, for Bosphorus Bridge, as I said, for retrofit, big Taylor dampers are used at these two uh, ends of at these two spans. For the Golden Horn Bridge, under the Golden Horn Bridge, these are the hysteric dampers. You can size them with the pupil here. So they are about twice the size of a pupil. Those are big hysteric dampers, but what happens is that during earthquakes, these two ends move, and then we have ductilities at these positions, so that that dissipates huge amount of energy. Those are, at that time, I think, imported from Taiwan, but they can be manufactured easily locally as well. And that's at the Yavu Sultan Selim Bridge. If, and those are the, those are the, uh, those are the, we say, hybrid bridge. So at this part, there's some, uh, there's a suspension. So these are the hangers of suspension, but those are the high angle, uh, these one, especially the high angle hangers that gives also all the cable state bridge. So it's both cable state bridge here and at the same time suspension bridge. So it's why it's called hanger. And to avoid the vibration of these things, these are, you can see those things. Those are installed on the, on the deck itself and they hold the, uh, these, uh, high angle stay cables through this mechanism. And this mechanism has two dampers here. So if you, when you pass through the bridge, you can see them clearly. Now, the, this is one of the TMDs. There are, I think, few in Turkey. That's on the top of the stack. That's the stack itself, two stacks. And then the this is the TMD unit. That one is TMD unit. It's such a thing that it is, it is a mess, essentially. Those are the hangers. And then the the frequency of this pendulum is adjusted to fit to the frequency of the de of this uh, stack itself. So that creates a motion that kills the vibration of it. Those are called wise tuned 
uh, tuned mass uh, dampers in the sense. And then uh, that's operation over there. There is another one that, uh, that has been designed, but will be installed soon uh, on, the, on, the, on another stack that's for that one. And then this one is the for the Tuprash Alea plant. That is not a damper in the sense that that is, that's not a, that's the mess and those are the hangers. But uh, the actual design is not of this sort, but it's of the sort that instead of those hangers, there are, these are the uh, natural rubber bearings and that's the mess itself. The, this natural rubber bearings and this mess creates a, essentially a mass, a mass system here, a vibration system here, but the free vibration of the system is set equal to the vibration of the this tower itself. So that's why it kills the motion at the top of the structure in, in the event of an earthquake. So that's, that's in that sense a novel application. We hope that these applications will increase in Turkey because retrofit, this is a retrofit structure, retrofit of such buildings, such uh, stacks is not easy. For one thing, you need to stop the operation and the stopping operation is a costly process in such uh, industrial facilities. Now we come to the important issues and considerations. So, so what we did so far is that we have seen the Turkish code and we have seen the had an idea of the applications here. The peer review process is an important process. It currently exists, but it may need to be increased more. Peer review process needs to be structured and become an integral part of the hazard assessment design and implementation of passive structural control applications. Currently, it exists mostly in the design of it and to some degree implementation, but it should include the hazard assessment as well. And the other thing is that the code should be developed for the use of dampers for the earthquake gas and design. This is another important uh, passive uh, control mechanism. Now, for the appropriate use of seismic isolation technology, in Turkey, I said, but it applies to other, some other countries as well. And the extension it is here, the following points are important. Now, one of them is that a reliable definition of the some uh, seismic input. Currently, most of the seismic input is taken from the code itself, which is very good. But then again, we are dealing with long period ground motion. And long period ground motion are affected by several things. And then the that has to be, I will come to that, that has to be in the, in the analysis that you cannot put in the code because those are site-specific things. You have to do a site-specific analysis, site-specific hazard assessment, but in the site-specific hazard assessment, you have to, you have to assess uh, several things. I will come to that. The other thing is that a rational and functional architecture design and structural design in line with the base isolation technology should be developed. That means that the, that means that we have to set the optimal type, optimal number of distribution of isolation, and those should be in conformity with the specific design objective. Once you design a base isolation for a building, you have to see what you're aiming. You can aim for low cost building, that's fine. You can aim for low base shear, that's also fine. You can also aim for low floor acceleration because there could be some equipment, some limitations on the floor acceleration that you want to protect the equipment. And the other low is displacement. You may not have much space for displacement, so you have to limit your displacement. Now, there is no system, no isolation system that meets you all these four criteria. So you have to set your criteria first and then go for it. The other thing, obviously, is careful selection, design, manufacturing, testing, installation, and protection, and maintenance of the seismic isolation units. Well, the way it goes in Turkey, as much as I know, is that whenever somebody wants to design a base isolated building, they approach the producer and then try to get the lowest price without checking how it's manufactured. And then when it comes to testing, you can see that many of the claims that made by the manufacturer may not follow what's being tested. But then again, testing may be done after the installation. So it would be very difficult to go back and correct things. And then once it is done and installed, the protection and the maintenance is, is not something done. And they can sit there with no maintenance. No maintenance may be good for the maybe 
well, at least applicable for the elastomeric isolators, but for the for the curved surface uh, friction systems, uh, maintenance is needed. Check off is needed, and then obviously good construction implementation with quality assurance, quality control with particular attention to seismic joints and lifelines isolation interface. Just to see that the, if the lifelines crossing the interface are working fine. In Japan, usually people use testing. So they give a displacement to the structure at the foundation and see the response of the lifelines crossing the isolation interface because it's easy to miss them. Now let's come to the design-based ground motion part. Uh, as, as I said, we use essential to uh, the both DB and MC ground motions. And for this, we give the Acceleration spectra and displacement spectra as cell phone. In this case, the displacement spectra is just the essentially you can is just the integral of this one. You can adjust it and to obtain this spectrum, but that's not essential what we want. And then this may not be a straight line here. So what would we're dealing is that mostly in this area, this area is of particular importance for the design of isolated structures. So we need to set the amplitude of motion here pretty carefully. One thing that is in our code is that the directionality. Now directionality means that there are two sorts of ground, two ground motions. That's the horizontal ground motion, that's the east-west and that's the north-south ground motion. And then the computation of the ground motion is based, is based on the Average uh, mean uh, in the excuse me, in the in the, is the mean of these two quantities, so that uh, so that the it may not give you the uh, exact value. For example, if suppose that if this is the if the peak acceleration here is three and the peak acceleration is four, with simple uh, combination of two vectors, you can see that the maximum should be five. But the, the computational uh, procedures that we use in the hazard does not use five, but use the square of three times four, square root of three times four, which is less than five. So we have to increase it to five so that to use it, uh, to, you, to do it properly, that calls directionality. And then to, in, to improve directionality, that's the geomean, that's used in the code itself, geomean results. We have to obtain the maximum ones. So the factor that we apply about 1.3 and that 1.3 in our computation of the displacement is placed here, this x in the code. Well, in our code, it exists implicitly, uh, explicitly here, but the, in the American code, it, it is there because the American code assigns the use of the maximum SA, so directionality, for all design, not for base isolation design, but for all structural design as well. That does not exist in the European code. So that's something that we have taken from the American code and put 1.3 here, just to reflect this thing here. Now that's just one thing for the uh, high, high period ground motion. The second thing is that if the, uh, in addition to the site amplification, well, site amplification is in the code essentially, if it is, class A, B, C, D uh, side class, then you can adjust the, the amplitude of the spectrum for that basis. But if you are close to a fault, then uh, it's <coughs> influenced by the, what we call the near fault factor. I'm not going to go to details of it, but these are taken from Caltrans for seismic design criteria in uh, 2019. What it says is that if you are less than 15 kilometers from a fault, you have to increase, you have to increase your uh, spectral amplitude between one and five, which is an area of concern for us for 1.2. That's what it says. So that means another 20% increase over what we did so far, including site amplification. So this comes at the top of site amplification. And there is one more thing that's called the basin effect. And the basin effect means that if you are in a big basin, basin means that it's just sediment filled valley, uh, lots of them in Turkey. And then the last one, 
that caused some damage, in fact, was in Izmir. That's in the Izmir Basin. And then the, over there, depending on the depth to 2.5 kilometer per second, this is that 2.5 means that depth to the 2.5 kilometer per second shear wave velocity. If that value is about, say, five kilometer or six kilometer, then there's an amplification factor under 40%, 1.4. And then the same thing in this case, this is given as Z10. Uh, that means that depth to the one kilometer, uh, one kilometer meter per second shear wave propagation velocity. And then again, if you use this one, then you can increase the motion by another 30%. Now in American codes, does not exist in the, uh, obviously in the European codes, but then again, those should be part of the, what we call the site specific analysis. Unfortunately, in Turkey, when people think about size specific analysis, all they think is that to do some shake analysis to show the effect of the ground motion if they do it. But in addition to that, we have to see the, uh, the near fault factor plus the basin factor. And if you, for example, if you want to build a structure, say in Los Angeles, these are the basin geometries in Los Angeles. For example, if you, if you built a structure here, then uh, you, you look here, you, you see here that this has a Z2.5, Z2.5 is about four kilometer here. So you go to the uh, curve and choose the amplification for four kilometer. Or if you want to use uh, Z1, again, this is the map of the same basin for that thing. So what I am saying is that the site specific analysis should be done real carefully. It should be done by people that know what you are doing Otherwise, otherwise you will end up with uh, limited ground motion or the displacement capacity on your systems. It may not be that much important for the uh, elastomeric isolators. The reason is that the elastomeric isolators, although our cause limits to about to, to certain limits, about 200% strain, they can go if they are built properly about 400%. They may, they may buckle, may not come back, but then again, it protects the structure. But if you use especially uh, 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 curved surface sliders, such as uh, what I call curved surface friction slider, in order not to use any any uh, company names, but those are the what we call the friction pendulum systems, then you have to be very precise in the computation of your uh, displacements. If you are not precise, then you can enlarge it. You can increase the capacity. It won't hurt the structure, but then again, it hurts the pockets of the people buying it because the uh, the price of the units increased by the square of the displacement capacity. So that's something that we have to pay attention. The reason being is that we are putting the safety of the structure on the isolator itself. So that's 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 something that you should keep in mind regarding the displacements. The other thing is that is the architectural and the structural design. Now, these are two structural designs that are intended to reduce the number of isolation units. So notice that you have here eight isolation, eight isolation units. And in this structure, there are two here and two at the back, probably four units. The tendency in the world, especially in Japan, is to use few large isolators. What has been the case in Turkey is that put one isolator under each column and two under each shear wall. The reason being is that in Turkey, most people first go to the isolator producer company and then the isolator producer company, they want to sell isolators. The design does not mean that it's an unsafe design. It could be a safe design, but it's an expensive design. It's a design just to put isolators under conventional, uh, conventional uh, structure. So you can, you design the structure as if it's a conventional design, conventional structure, then put isolators on it. That's not an isolated building. Well, it is an, it is not engineering. What to, to do engineering, you have to be able to reduce and optimize the number of isolators. So that's one thing that's important. Just show you a case here. These are, uh, this is the, this was the largest building, isolated building in 1917. And now I said the largest isolated building is obviously the, the Başakşehir Hospital in Turkey, but at that time it, this was. You can see the, this is 200 meters, this again 200 meters, this again 200 meters. This is Adana city, we have seen it. 
it just fits in the, in the middle of this. This is a huge structure, obviously. And this is Başakşehir Hospital. This is somewhat comparable to this one, but this again is a, is a as, at least it is uh, area. The foot, uh, the, the, the seating area is, is much larger than, than the other one. So this whole, bit, whole structure, this use 700 triple friction bearing uh, systems, 700, this uses 1,552, and this used 2,040, okay. The studies that was done for this one indicate that the investigation can indicate that if the precast elements were used, the construction time and cost would have been reduced and the number of isolators would have been halved. It was not realized because there was not capacity to produce precast elements in time and in size needed. So it was not done due to ecological reasons. Another study that we have made is that the, for example, number of hospital beds per isolator units used in base isolator hospital is only one in Turkey. It is three in California. If you look at the folks on New Stanford Hospital, there are 600 beds and 200 isolated units. If you look at San Francisco General Hospital, about 300 beds and about 110 isolated units. So we manage to use uh, one bed per one isolation unit, whereas the in other countries it's one to three. That's if you ask me, it's, it's, it is not proper engineering. If you engineer them properly, I'm sure that we will end up with a much uh, optimized structures. The, once we talk about Apple Park building, let me talk on it for a while. Apple Park building is put on an essential on a ring type of donut type shape here. It has uh, 104 radio sectors. These are all radio sectors. And all of them are precast. This is a precast structure, okay? And then there are, uh, it uses about 4,000 slabs. It says void slabs because there are two layer slabs. And between the slabs, you passed all the uh, all the electricity, water, everything between the slabs, two slabs, and about 300,000 meter square precast columns, walls, and beams. Everything is precast. Now, if you if you look at it, this is the uh, well. These are the as I said, the void slab hoisting. This part is the void part. From here, you put all the utilities. This is uh, girders, precast holders. These are the precast shear walls. And this is the floor section rendering. And that is the, and this one uh, is the construction stage and that's the final structure. This I call a real engineering piece, okay? Because everything people worked on it. This is from the start, it was designed as an isolated building. It was not designed as a conventional building, then put the isolators underneath. The one thing that comes from out of these things is that what we should aim in Turkey, especially for, we should aim for base isolated modular buildings. That is very important and that can be used for housing, for building dormitories, schools and hospitals. They can be built at high speed and low cost. Now the seismic behavior of precast buildings depend on the characteristics of the connection elements, especially the stiffness, ductility, and the formation capacity of them and the connection between precast members between them and then their connection to foundation. And if you look at the reasons of the inadequate performance of precast buildings in past earthquake, they are also due to the poor design, the poorly built connections because they were not base isolated. If you put them under base isolation, then the, the you don't need that much ductility on these connections and then you can make much simpler connections between them because the force that will come on them would be limited. The other thing is that with such structures, the uh, well, if you put a, for example, a moment frame structure, even a structure with shear walls on top of isolation isolations, and if you uh, if you go more than say ten stories high, then the period of the structure fixed weight itself is about one second. So if you increase the 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 isolation period to three seconds, that's not much. But then again, if you use, a, for example, a modular structure or a structure with the, uh, say, structure with even with, say, for example, formwork uh, type of construction or even with uh, precast panels, then the period uh, would be very low. And then the isolated period would be high so that the gap between two periods would be very high. And that's what we want for structural uh, performance. Now, this is a uh, this is a type of modular building that's very common in the 
while I was in Japan, in the United States is picking up. And then in, in Thailand, they do almost most of their structures as modular buildings. These are the modules here, okay? They just stacked on top of each other and they're connected to each other. And then the type of connection, if it is isolated, is a simple connection, okay? If they are not isolated and if they're in earthquake area, then it's a different story. So I'm not suggesting, what I am suggesting is that we should do this type of construction, but they should be seismically isolated. And for seismic isolation, what we ask for the double mat foundation. So this is one mat here, we put the isolators here, and that's the mat under these buildings. Now, building that mat is very easy because there will not be any concentrated loads on it, it will be just uniform loads. And these are the isolators. I will come in a while that for such systems, we can also develop low cost isolators. Now, this is uh, another view from the uh, modular construction. As I said, they come, the modules can come at the back, back of the trucks. Those are big trucks that have the modules. Everything can be installed on them. All you need to just stack them up on top of each other. That's how, it, how they're being built. And then I will come in a while the uh, there are lots of books on them for those interested and there's design module construction. You can do module construction for housing, you can do it for hospital, and you can do it for schools. And that's essentially covers the basic needs for most of the people uh, in our countries. The main benefits are they can be designed to encompass all essential components of building. You can do it for elevator shaft, for stairs and corridors, and then the models are concerned in quality control production facilities. So there's no problem with the quality. And you can include in them the pipe, piping, the cabling for electricity. And if you want, you can also put kitchen and back, bedroom equipment. Or if they're intended for hospitals, you can also put several medical equipment in them already. And then uh, if you don't need them in 10 years and want to use somewhere else, you can remove them and reuse them. Now, the most conventional building units around the world are built as system modules that are eventually connected laterally to a cast dance to prefabricate core that serves as a primary lateral load resting element. If they are not using seismic isolation, you need some sort of a core, uh, either prefabricate or cast in situ so that you can take the lateral loads. Now, if you use base isolation, then the assembly of the prefabricated modules alone could be used as structural system through a structure feasible low cost construction. They can be connected to each other in both horizontal and vertical directions through bolted plates. The isolators that can be placed under the mat foundation optimum number of distribution for such purposes, low cost isolation barriers can also be considered. And then this is a low cost elastomeric isolators. They have been, they are known probably probably last 15 years, but I do not know they are, I don't think they are com commercially produced and the testing done is not done on full samples or small samples, but that testing uh, gives enough indication that they can be used for uh, full structures. What this does is that the, the fries or fiber reinforcers, they use the carbon fiber mesh instead of steel plates. That, is uh, provides twofold uh, ease for you. One of them is that the steel plates are expensive than carbon fiber mesh. The second is that you don't need to cook them for vulcanizing. For elastomeric uh, isolators with steel plates, you need to cook them for long durations under high heat so that the rubber and the steel plates get vulcanized. That is a very expensive and time consuming operation. In this case, there are special epoxies that uh, connect the fiber mesh and the steel plates, and then you can produce them any size, any size, and then you can cut them to the size you want. The damping is more than that of the steel plates. The reason is that because the, there is also some damping provided by the fiber stand itself. And as I said, the cost of production is much lower. The, these are taken from uh, James Kelly, which is one of the pioneers in the, in the use of the elastomers in the structure business. And what says that performance of the fry is shown to be superior to the, the SRI. SRI means they're still reinforced elastomeric isolators in view of the horizontal stiffness and vertical isolator. It's possible to produce a fry that matches the view of SRI. Another thing for those things is that obviously what uh, is shown here is that 
is that, as you can see, this uh, we can put it between the structure and foundation directly. You don't need a top plate and bottom plate unless you put it, you cut a column and put it. Obviously, you can you can use it under the columns itself, but in this case, then you have to put a steel top and bottom plate because it does not allow much for the formation. Whereas if you put it in a double mat foundation, then you can just put it by itself without any top and bottom plates. Now this is the this is 25% strain, the shape it takes. This at 50% strain. Notice that there are some movements here. This is because that no steel plate at top and bottom. And if you go to 100%, if you go to 100%, that's the shape. If you go to 200%, this part means that this part just joins to the top here and this part joins to the top here, but this thickness real does not change. That is the that is the beauty of it, okay? And then the uh, this is the rollover part, and then this is then the rollover starts here, then that's the softening part, and that's the stiffening part here. And you can see the hysteresis curves it goes and picks up here, which is what is needed in, in such systems. As I said, these are very good if you use a double mat uh, planes, uh, double mat foundations, and then put it in, in between those foundations for uh, isolation purposes. As I said, it's a low cost that can be produced and can be used, but that's something that uh, may need to be developed for the to to increase the use in a much wider arena uh, in Turkey and other similar countries as well. Well, this concludes my presentation. And uh, I hope I didn't bore you and I will thank you all. Now I I leave the floor to probably to uh to Mehmet and then Bahadur so that if there are any questions, I'll be pleased to answer them. Uh, thank you, Professor Mustafa Erdik. We will go ahead and take some time for questions now. Just a reminder, please be sure to type your questions into the question box in your control panel in our YouTube channel. Uh, maybe first question, uh, Farzat Hejazi asks, uh, thanks for your very interesting presentation. Why there is very high interest in Turkey, Turkey to use of triple pendulum isolators? Well, it is, I think the reason is mostly logistical because it's, it is uh, installed in parts and then people just put the parts together and produce an isolator. So the, 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 uh, the essential developers and the constructors want them supplied very fast. And then the, the other type of isolators do not have such a large production system. And then as you can see, the number of isolators that are needed for a big structure needs 2000. And if you ask 2000 isolators in, every, in the time frame of six, six months, not every company can uh, meet that thing. So that's, that's one of the reasons why it's preferred. And also the second question again, uh, Farzat Hajazi asks, as in some of design, it is obvious that triple pendulum never acts for second or third phase. However, still there is insisting to use triple pendulum bearings by owner. Well, that's the decision of the engineer. I mean, they, if they are each and every uh, isolation system can be used, if the engineers uh, see, see that they are fit to business and they pass tests. So I don't think why they cannot be used, but then again, it should be part of the engineer. And also uh, third question, Abdurrahim Üzüm asks, how to apply hybrid control system in high rise structure? How to what? How to apply hybrid control system in high rise structure? Well, it, I mean, you have to either you have to think in the beginning or some of them can be done in retrofit fashion because the mm. now most of the high rise buildings, uh, well, in Turkey, other countries, they are built properly. But then again, the new code says that they have to build with respect to the say 2% or 2.5% uh, response spectrum, damped response spectrum, whereas the most of them in existence are built for 5%. So, what you have to do, you may need to increase the damping of the high rise structure itself so that it can easily meet the uh, demands from the earthquake. So that what you can do, you can install some isolators, uh, some damping units in the system, 
there are wall damping units that does not attract attention, or you can even put a tune mass damper at the top of it, or you can do it in the beginning. But in the beginning, the tune mass dampers are mostly used for not for earthquake purposes, but for human comfort. For retrofit business, then the tune mass damper can be important. Uh, also, another question. Uh, why uh, seismic isolation uh, is not common uh, for the five to 10 stories buildings in Turkey? Is it due to the uh, cost or is it due to the uh, mostly uh, foreign companies uh, patented isolators? Or uh, no. is there any a local isolator company no. in Turkey? Yeah, local isolators are also produced in Turkey, but the most of the uh, four or five story buildings do not see much of an, uh, I would say advanced engineering design. And then the, in the designers, they don't want to go to a subject that they are not familiar with. I'm sure that eventually it may change and then people can start using isolation because it's produced local as well for uh, mid-rise structures as well. Thank you. And also another question, how can, FREI fixed to MET Foundation. Thank you. You don't have to fix them. You just put that over there, and then the and the friction at top of it is is fixed itself at the connections. Uh, could you say about uh, another question? What is the situation we have to use uh, isolator and dampers, viscose dampers together in which conditions? And also, is there any test facility in Turkey? Well, lots of, well, there's a big test facility in Turkey and lots of small ones. So there's no problem on this, but the, I would suggest the, I would not suggest that much the use of the viscous isolators with vis viscous damping with the isolation units. If you need additional damping, hysteretic ones would do a better job. Although they are, they, the phase may be different. So you may have some difficulties in that. But then again, the, what is lacking in my country is most of the maintenance the uh, viscous dampers need maintenance, especially if they stay for a long time without much motion. If they are subject to frequent earthquakes, it's fine. But if they wait and sit and sit, sit over there for tens of years, then an earthquake comes, they uh, to ensure that they would work in proper order, they need to maintain them. That is, that's problematic. Uh, thank you. Uh, also, Dr. Alessandro, Alessandro Martelli is here. And also he would like to say his special greetings to you because you are old friends, I assume. Uh, he says, uh, excellent presentation, Mustafa. I hope to see you soon again. Well, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, I do the same, but unfortunately for timing, we operate from home. So I'm sure that you do the same in Italy and hope that these things will go over and we'll, we'll be able to sit face in face. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, also, many questions, but I don't know. Uh, could you answer because you are tired? Could you make a comparison uh, uh, between LRB, pendulum, and uh, I couldn't understand type isolators? What are main characteristic differences regarding different criteria such as displacement, vibration, shear, etc.? Et well, I don't understand the question, Mehmet. Could you repeat it again? Uh, could you make a comparison? between LRB pendulum type isolators. LRB and pendulum type isolators. Yes. Uh, what are main characteristic, uh, what are main uh, differences, I think? In well, I mean, they, they can be used uh, interchangeably, but the, to start with the, the, the friction surface uh, or the curved surface friction lines are intended for low loads. So the low, load on top of them can be low. For uh, for the for uh, LRB type of isolators, you need a sizable load on top of them. So that's one distinction you can make between them. The other one is the maintenance. The the uh, especially if you are in a position that you cannot maintain properly. Sometimes I have seen cases in Turkey that the there's flooding of water even under basements at the location of the isolators. If the if it is elastomeric isolators, nothing would happen. But if it is uh, curves or friction type of slides, then you have to take precaution for that. And you may need to test them after such an incident. Mm -hmm. 
uh, another question Ahmet Yıldırım asks uh, when you do when you are doing retrofit uh, and when you are uh, using uh, viscose dampers uh, could you say the minimum uh, concrete quality for uh, those structure to be retrofitted? Well, for the type of structures that we have in Turkey, type of reinforced concrete structure in Turkey, it is very difficult to make a retrofit using mm. uh, uh, using dampers. The reason is that for dampers to, to, to work, uh, if you put them between stories, you need the uh, relative velocity between two floors. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, dampers do not work. In, the, in Turkish type of buildings, the buildings are so rigid that essentially the velocity that you get between two floors are minimum. So you should be able to able to amplify that velocity through, you can use scissor jack type of motions or you can put dampers between, not at, at each floor, but between two, three floors, then you may be able to do something, but that is very difficult for the type of structures in Turkey if you want to retrofit them through uh, dampers. And also, Jan Aiken told uh, Professor Erdik, thank you for a very interesting presentation. You mentioned peer review. Is it mandated in Turkey? Well, it is. It is, but not not necessarily for ground motion. For uh, uh, for uh, design, yes. But what uh, what it's usually done individually. What we think that if if we have a team over there that's doing the work, it's much more important than. What I have seen is that what I have seen so far is that the the design is not real that bad. Um, there is really good period for the design, but when it comes to ground motion, people take this granted that whatever the you get from the code that says that should be correct, that should be maybe correct legally, but it's not it's not the correct displacement. You need to carry out a site specific study, taking care if it is on a basin or if it's close to a fault on all those things, and then. I don't think that's done properly. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, Ramazan Livoğlu. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Hocam, for your presentation. I wonder, do you have any doubt in your mind for a special friction pendulum system? In other words, do we have any earthquake experience for a, such a big system? Well, lots of experience exists for the friction pendulum systems, mostly in South America and Colombia and also in, in Chile, in several earthquakes. We don't have such an experience in Turkey, but that experience in part of the world exists. And then the most of the experience for the elastomeric isolators come from Japan. Earthquake, real earthquake experience. And also uh, Zehra Elçin Gürsoy asks, thanks for organizing this webinar and to Professor Mustafa Erdik for the presentation. What would you suggest for high-rise buildings bracing damper systems or free pendulum base isolation? Well, um, obviously, the in the United States, the isolators are used to, to isolate tall buildings, and then they, but there are different type of isolators. As, as a few isolators are used, and they, they, they are usually it comes with heavy damping systems. So that's a Japanese system. It's not used much in the world. In Turkey, it's much better to use uh, either... Uh, external damping system in the structure or the or the buckling uh, prevented braces the exception is that the again the if they are not made out of steel most of the reinforced concrete tall builders in turkey are again rigid enough so you may not be able to use those uh, either dampers or braces in one floor but you may opt for two three floors so that you can get uh, you can get benefit from them thank you and Ilkin Sevigen asks, instead of speed up and save time, isn't, isn't it better to use sliders as much as possible? Thank you. Well, essentially, yes. But then again, sliders are not centering. They do not recenter. Mm. So an earthquake happens, they may stop at a the position. Then an aftershock happens, it may take it even to the out of its limits. So that's that's the problem with use of the sliders. You need a, you need a centering mechanism. So the, our codes does not allow slides by, them by themselves because they don't have a centering mechanism. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
but to all of you asks uh, thank you very much do you have any information about the performance of the isolators used in Folkart towers during Izmir earthquake uh in Folkart towers isolators are not used but i know that the, the buckling prevented brace are used i don't have any information on them uh -huh. there are there, there were two buildings in the in Izmir with base isolation one of them is the data center turkcell data center the other one is the Izmir hospital Izmir City Hospital. Izmir City Hospital. The it was not open yet, so the 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 essentially the uh, the isolators were locked and they didn't move. And then although the isolators were free to move in the data center, they didn't move because the problem the ground acceleration level is about say five percent at the most, and then the the initial friction on the isolator systems is about five percent, so they didn't move at all. And also, Ömer Odobashi from uh, Pavia uh, asks, greetings from Pavia, Italy, to, to the professor, and thanks for the interesting presentation. My question is, would, would funding a large-scale testing facility in Turkey help make the practice more widespread? I'm asking because I know for a fact both Bahadur and Ömer Ülker often came to EU Center, Italy, for the tests. Well, there is such a center now in, in, in Eskişehir, in fact. And then it is an operation. But the, 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 what, what we need first is that to, to uh, increase the applications in Turkey. Then, then the demand will arise for even more centers. But just building the center and, and waiting for the demand does not work. First, we have to increase its widespread use, and then the rest would come automatically. And also, Baha Dr. Bahadur Shadan asks, uh, the isolators used in some other regions where we know large magnitude earthquakes occur, like in South America, have less displacement capacities and demands than the ones we use here. What would be the reason for of this? And also uh, the, the other one from Bahadur. Many sites at the coast in Istanbul are very close to fault, to the fault. The seismic hazard and displacement demands are very high on the isolators. Sometimes make it impossible to apply seismic isolators alone without dampers. Are these hazard parameters realistic? Well, currently that's the state of the art, the way we compute them. If they are realistic or not, you have to wait, for example, for uh, two, three thousand years and see if they are realistic or not. <laughs> we, we may not see the results, but the, currently what we are talking about, the state of the art in assessing the ground motion, because uh, the, we put all the safety on the isolation and we don't want to take any chances on that. Thank you. And also other question. Uh, in some projects, 100 percent of the isolators are tested. Some projects, for example, Minister of Health hospital projects, 30% of the isolators tested. Uh, could you say, what are your talks on this uh, issue? Testing, I mean, production testing. Well, the, I mean, production testing is something that you want to keep the uh, exceptions. And producers do not usually produce bad ones. There should be one or two bad ones that you want to catch them. If you are dealing with uh, 1,000 isolators, and if you have 10 of them bad, it's it's not probably a very big deal because the others can take care of that. But if you are using with, uh, say, 10 isolators or 20 isolators, then it's a very big deal. So it depends also on the number of isolators that you use for the structure itself. Also, do, uh, I can ask uh, the last question. Uh, Oh, sorry, another one <laughs> came already. Uh, do you have any information on the performance of the isolators in Turkey during a real earthquake? No, I don't. Uh, I haven't seen any yet. Okay. The last one I can take for uh, Bekir Pekmezci from ITU. For your information in our country, there is an independent laboratory holding ISO, uh, IEC, uh, 17025 laboratory accreditation certificate that conducts tests according to the principles of the EN 15129. Okay, thank you. Uh, it looks like we have covered all of the, our questions, uh, Dr. Mustafa Erdik. Is there anything else you wanted to cover before wrap up? Uh, 
No, thank you. I think that the, I, I wish, uh, you know, good day or good night to all of the listeners here and then thank them for their patience, for listening to me and, and then stay safe in these difficult days. That's, that's all I have to say. Okay. Thank you very much. Sure. Uh, and thank you, everyone. We appreciate you being here. We will continue webinar series. Therefore, please follow our social media accounts for our next webinars. Thanks again for joining us today and we will see you next time. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye.